Hallelujah, praise the name of Jesus Christ. Good evening, brothers and sisters, friends and family. It's good to be here again sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. Welcome to our midweek ministration. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. My name is Pastor Femi Alara of Living in the World International Church, a place where we preach Christ undiluted and we receive the keys to fulfill our destinies. My prayer is that you shall fulfill your destiny in the precious name of Jesus Christ. I still want to say Happy New Month to every single person. I know some people have seen me for the very, very first time this month of December. And this month is titled but prophetically by the word of the Lord to me that this month is a month of divine reward. And therefore, our series of teaching this month has been titled WAIT. And um, WAIT has different acronym. One of the reasons why we say WAIT is why am I talking? Sometimes you just have to listen twice as much as you are going to speak. Sometimes you just have to persevere through the challenging times that you are going through. Sometimes you just have to keep at it because your reward is imminent. And I pray that whatever it is that you're going through at this hour, that God will give you the grace to endure it. One of the scriptures I love so much is the Bible tells us clearly that, uh, that he will never put more on us than we can bear. So that means whatever we are going through at this hour, we surely can handle it. That's why God has allowed it to us. I mean, men who are wicked would not allow um, a featherweight to go into the ring with an heavyweight boxer. No matter how much the featherweight thinks he's good, he has no chance against an heavyweight in the boxing ring. If that ever happens, somebody's about to commit murder. Now, if God is good, and we say that all the time, God is good, surely he would not let us go into the ring with an heavyweight demon if we were still featherweight in our, in our faith. So therefore, I'm assured that whatever I'm going through at this hour, I can handle it. And I want you to believe that with me, that whatever you are going through at this hour, you can handle it. So therefore, you can persevere through it. The second most important thing I would like us to know is that um, the month of December is anybody's month. The reason I say that is because if you look at a professional boxing bout, um, there's 12 rounds. Uh, recently, Anthony Joshua just fought uh, Andy Ruiz and they, they fought for 12 rounds. Now, in the 12th round, I remember I seen Andy Ruiz waving to Joshua to please come, fight me in the middle of the ring. Let's go for a slug fist. And the reason he's saying that because he knows he has lost on the cards. He has lost by point. And if Joshua fell for his trap, that would be game over because he can be knocked out. So I want you to know that you and I, when we get into the 12th round, it doesn't matter what the scorecard has been from January 2019 to the hour we are speaking. When it gets to the 12th round, is anybody's round. And I pray that this month you shall recover all that you have lost in the precious name of Jesus Christ. So wait on the Lord. My, my soul, wait patiently on the Lord. That's what the psalmist said in the books of Psalm 40, if you read from verse 1 to 3. Now, let's pray as we hear the word this evening. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Father, we thank you for those far you have helped us. This month, you have been our guide, you've been our savior. From January to date, you have protected us, shielded us. For he that is joined to a living is better than the, is, 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 there's hope for him. Lord, a living dog is better than a dead lion. We thank you for life. We thank you for health. We thank you for wellness. We thank you for a sound mind. We are not in the mortuary. We are not on the deathbed. You have kept us alive and well because of your mercy and grace. Father, as we sit at your feet this evening to hear your word, please open our eyes of understanding and reveal your perfect truth to us. Encourage our heart. Motivate us to keep pressing forward. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is found in the books of Micah chapter 7 verse 8. Micah chapter 7 verse 8. I said, the Bible says there, it said, Rejoice not over me, my enemies, for when I fall, I shall rise again. Resolve, rejoice not over me, my enemies. When I fall, I shall rise again. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Uh, let me start with a, a story or something I remember sometime this week. Um, I remember a friend uh, that uh, we used to share ideas and talk a lot on the phone. Now, he was married many some years ago now. He, he was married then and I wasn't. So he, when we get on the phone, he will, um, well, I would say, subtly insult me that I'm not married. He will say, well, it's only when you get married, you will know how to control your house, how, how, how to manage people, how to be able to do this. Not knowing secretly he was a wife bitter, but yet he was insulting me. So I will say things, I will like, 
But you know, in terms of corporate uh, corporate world, I'm a lot higher than you are. I mean, in terms of success, I'm a lot higher than you are. But yet, you are insulting me about me not being married. So he will make jest and I will make it subtly, not directly to my face. And I will keep quiet and I won't say anything. But there's one thing that God has always kept me, that's always kept me going, is that God always tells me, don't worry, your tomorrow shall be all right. Everything shall be all right. In due season, you're getting married. Not long after that, I got married. And then uh, suddenly the, the children began to come. So I, had to, I began to have children. And he's still waiting on the Lord for children. And he's, then he was making fun of me. But now he, when, he, when he sees me, he's expecting me to pray for him and say, Ah, please, you need to pray for me. I mean, I don't know what I'm, I've done. That's why it is not good to let your enemy, don't worry about the gloating of your enemies or your secret enemies. Those are your Judas in your camp. No matter what they are saying to you, they might even tell you, cause God and die. Like the wife of Job told Job, after the predicament that happened to him, that he lost everything that he had. He said, do you still hold on to your integrity in God? He said, curse God and die. But Job said, shall we accept good from God and not evil? You read that in the books of Job chapter 2. Something that makes me glad is the Bible says, clearly in the books of Proverbs 24 verse 16, he said, the righteous might fall seven times. He said, he will rise, but his wicked stumble, and when calamity, when calamity rise, uh, strikes. John 16, verse 33, Jesus said, he said clearly, he said, in this world, you will have troubles. He said, be of good cheer, I have overcome. So whatever you're going through, it's not peculiar to you. If you hear other people's story, you will be shocked. So don't threaten God that you are quitting. Don't threaten your boss that you are quitting. Don't threaten your husband that you're quitting. Don't threaten your children that you're quitting. Because believe me, you have it well. I've shared this story before uh, as an illustration. I would like to share it again tonight. And that's the story of a man of God that um, who was being bombarded by his um, members. Constantly bombarded about, ah, pastor, things are not going well. Oh, things are not doing this. Oh, I have that challenge. I have this challenge. So he told every one of them, he said, okay, listen to me. I want every one of you to come to the service, to come to the church on Sunday morning. And every one of your challenges shall be solved. You know, see, when people are used to the same old routine, every one of them began to think he was going to bring a guest minister into the church, a, a, a lot more anointed than himself, and he's going to lay hands and lay legs. So uh, some even people even brought some anointing oil into the service. Some brought handkerchiefs. They want to live with the man too. By the time the service finishes, he said, all he said to them was, come into the service on Saturday morning, and every one of you will have your problem solved. Everybody didn't know how he was going to do it. So everybody anticipated. They brought oil. They brought um, um, handkerchief. They brought this. They brought that. Just because they believed that he's going to anoint them. And he's going to pray heavily. And the yoke is going to be broken. So they got into the service. They did the uh, opening prayer. They did the praise and worship. And finally, he told them to please sit down. And then he told the ushers, please give them a piece of paper. Allow them to write what they are going through. So everybody wrote, he said, write as much detail as possible, whatever it is you're going through, that you like God to resolve. So some people began to write what's going on. They can't pay their rent. Um, they're struggling with their overdraft and so on and so on. The bank is waiting to collect the house. And everybody wrote their own. Some people wrote that I have HIV. Some people wrote I've just been diagnosed with cancer and so on and so forth. So everybody wrote this. He said, praise God. He said, now I want you to fold it up. Once you are folded it up, I said, I don't want you to put your name on it. Just, I want the ushers to collect it. So everybody thought, yes, he's going to anoint us now. He's definitely going to anoint the paper. The Ark of Covenant. Oh, yes, praise God. So all he did was, okay, now ushers, those of you on the, rest, on the left, I want you to move to the right. Those of you on the right, I want you to move to the left. I want you to just, just redistribute the papers to everybody else. So everybody's like, oh, what's, what's going on here? So they picked up the new, the new piece of paper. They said, please don't open it. Give me a moment, let everybody get a piece of paper. And then finally, he said, open the paper and read it. And as soon as they opened the paper, they began to read. They realized that, he said, whatever you read in that paper will be your new, will be your new challenge or new trouble that you're going through. So somebody opened the first paper and they said, I'm going through, um, I'm, uh, I have cancer. I've been diagnosed with cancer. I'm on stage four. And they have given me three months to leave. 
And he, know, he, know, he noticed that the problem that he wrote on the piece of paper that he submitted was simply he cannot pay his house rent. So he quickly got up and said, Pastor, please, I would like my own problem back, please. This one is cancer. I don't want it. All I have is I can't pay my house rent and I'm, I am struggling. So let me swap cancer. I will gladly take my house rent for cancer. Everybody has a cross to carry. And nobody should feel like they are, they are worse off than the other person because you don't know the full story of the other person. Like it's commonly said, even the rich cries. And I pray that you will not lose heart before your miracle comes. Sometimes when we work so hard and we don't see reward, we get despair or discouraged. Discouragement always leads to despair. Bible clearly says in Galatians chapter 6 verse 9, it says we should not be weary in doing good. Do not be weary in sowing good seed. The problem is that many of us want to skip steps in the process of God. And God is very, very, very pedantic. I mean, God is very, very thorough. For example, would you be scared if a baby came out of the womb today and all of a sudden he has an iPhone in his hand and is taking selfies? Wouldn't you be very scared of that baby? And the moment he came out of the, out of the womb and he, he said, Daddy, can I have your iPhone, please? I'm taking a picture. I'm just uh, new to the world. And then he's putting it on Facebook. Won't you get scared? I mean, a baby has to go through the same stages. And I keep saying, no matter how hard and how long you pray over a pregnant woman who's just six months pregnant, she would not deliver a healthy baby. You don't know why others are reaping their, seed, their rewards so quickly and why yours is waiting. It might be because they have spent a lot more time watering the ground fertilizing the ground, doing what they are supposed to do, and they are out and supposed to do it, and then now their reward is coming, you're getting jealous. I often say to my wife, I say, well, the kind of seed that we sow, determine the kind of harvest that we get. If we sow to the flesh, of the flesh we shall reap corruption. If we sow to the spirit, of the spirit you shall live life eternal. That is the book of Galatians. I mean, you can quote me anywhere on that one. And you can't sow mangoes and they expect to reap apples. So what kind of seed you're sowing? If you're expecting a financial harvest, you must have been sowing financial seed. It's inevitable. That's the way it works. If you want, it's a blessed are the merciful. If you read the books of Matthew chapter 5, it says blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. That means if, you're, if you want the seed of mercy in your life, then you almost also be sowing the seed of mercy. Or you want, the, you want the act of mercy in your life. So every one of us must understand that like beget like. According to Genesis chapter 1, it said, let everything reproduce after its own kind. Like beget like. This is so crucial and important to every one of us. So, even when you're working hard and you're not seeing results, trust me, like I gave the example of the bamboo tree, your reward is coming. It's inevitable. I mean, we can talk about uh, powers that can destroy your reward. No, number two, some of the reasons sometimes that we feel like or we want to quit, like I said last week Sunday, we're going to look at part two of this, is that sometimes we underestimate the, the work required to get it done. I remember many years ago when I was in university, I was doing the, my first degree. There were people that I started with in first year, they did not last the second year because they simply could not cope with it. I've seen people who started the same course with me Got to the second year, they changed their course. They started another course. Got to the, the this feed up for a few months. They changed their course again, went to another course. They kept changing on and changing and on and changing and changing. Because they are looking for the easiest way out, but there's no easy way out. And they found out that every course seems to have its own challenge. You see, when you underestimate what you are about to face, you're bound to quit when you get in the middle of it. That's the problem. Many people underestimate their challenges. Don't underestimate the enemy that you're facing. Don't underestimate the powers that be that wants to fight you. The devil is not in it for fun fair. He's in it for the long haul. So you also must be prepared for the long haul. That whatever it takes to get to my victory, I will get there. Because there's nothing that you have expensed that you will not recover back and much more. That's the thing about it. So he will try to discourage you. He will try to do, make you despair and make you quit. Because the moment you quit, he knows that you are not, not going to get anything. Nobody makes excuses and quit and gets any reward. It doesn't work that way. No matter how long the battle is, you must be in for the long haul. 
Some people are prepared for just a one-day journey. It's not a one-day battle. You don't go to church, have one Friday prayer meeting, and expect the battles of your life to be over. The moment you strike the devil, he goes back to go and re-strategize and think about how he can hold you stronger. So when you keep at it, is when you actually are able to take him out completely. I'm praying for you in the name of Jesus Christ that you will not quit before you get your reward. We can read the books of Luke chapter 14, verse 28 to 33. Luke 14, 28 to 33. The Bible talks about a man that wants to build a house must first sit down to consider the cost and look at if he has enough money to be able to build. List his stats, he laid the foundation and he cannot finish it and everybody begins to laugh at him. And it says also, if you look verse 30, you see, he said, you see a king, or 31, if you see a king that wants to go to war, and he has not sat down to consider if he has enough to actually face the enemy that's coming against him. At least he gets into the between the battles, and then he gets scared. You see, one of the reasons why America was so sure that he was going to defeat ISIS was because, or Russia was so sure, was because they know they have the resources, they have the time, they have the capability to take care of them. They might be able to run riot for some time, but believe me, eventually they will get captured. America has experience of facing the first Gulf War, Gulf War second Gulf War. Now, going after ISIS was not going to be a difficult issue because they've had experience already. Many of us have not yet experienced the battles of life enough to be able to say, I can estimate with accuracy what is coming against me and how long it will take. A woman that's looking forward to getting pregnant, gets pregnant, and then in the first month, oh, a pregnant pregnant makes you glow. Oh, it looks beautiful. Wait you get to the sixth month or seven month, wait till you get when you start having money sickness, wait till you start, you know, un unable to walk and you're wobbling on the on the on the street. Wait till you walk and you're trying to pick up a pen on the floor and you have to bend your whole back and you're feeling pain. And then you say, Oh, believe me, I don't want pregnancy anymore. But, but I thought in the beginning you said pregnancy makes you glow. Because you have not underestimated, you have underestimated how long it will take you, how much it will cost you. Sometimes you get in the middle of it and you're like, man, I want to quit. I get this thing out of me. Number three, God is a God of process. A caterpillar does not become a butterfly overnight. It takes a process. That ugly looking thing on the floor, that like, a caterpillar, and you want to smash it with your feet. One day becomes that beautiful butterfly, butterfly that rests on your finger that you want to take a picture and selfie with. Many of us don't understand that God is changing us from one level of glory to the next. If you read the books of 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, he said, We all who at unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, we are transformed into his image, ever increasing glory when the Lord comes. So we are changed from one level of glory to the next. Continuously. So God is patient with us in every area of our lives. God is patient with us in every area of our life. You see, one of the prayers that you should pray is that ask God, what area of my life am I still lacking? Because you're increasingly changing to the image of his dear son and you're going from one level of glory to the next. I want you to understand this. You're not at the same level you were last year, December. Physically, believe me, you were not. You have changed. You might not see it, one day, the other day, I was speaking to my wife and I saw gray hair. I said, praise God. <laughs> God is faithful. He said, what is it? I said, I saw gray hair. He said, I can see you too. I said, I can see yours too. So we both laughed at each other. In other words, whether you believe it or not, you're winding on the clock. You're getting older. You might have the pancake, the Mary Kays, and all the cakes on the face. But believe me, the time is still going. So God is a God of process. And you can't rush God when it comes to process. Moses tried to rush God. That's why at the age of 40, when he killed the Egyptian, because he was maltreating the Israelite, suddenly God had to send him back to school because it seems that like you don't understand it yet. It was the same anger and lashing out that cost him the promised land 40 years later because he did not deal with it completely. See, sometimes they might pass you to the next class, but if you have not really dealt with the issue, you will face it later on in the future often tell students, there's no shortcuts to glory. There's no shortcuts to success. If you cheat in an examination, you cannot cheat in life because eventually you'll get to a workplace where you have to do the work yourself and then there's nobody you're going to be able to copy. You might be able to feel, um, I mean, fool the examiner that you're very, very smart. I mean, you can get the paper into the examination or the question and the answer into the examination, 
But when it gets to life, when you have to face senior managers, senior stakeholders, um, the executive um, uh, officer of the company, you can't fake it. So it takes a process to learn to develop the skills that we need to get to the next level. And I pray that you will not quit before you get there. Number four, I believe now quitters cannot be leaders because the, the leaders are those who are able to see the potential reward after they defeat their Goliath. That's why David could face Goliath. Everybody else was crying and wailing. First Samuel chapter 17, if you read the entire story, one to the end. Everybody was crying. Everybody was disgraced. Even Saul, who was supposed to be the biggest, the strongest in the kingdom, was afraid. But David asked, he said, so what shall be the reward from the king for whoever killed and takes away the reproach of Israel? So the king will give him his daughter as his, as his wife. He will exempt his family from taxes and so on and so forth. He said, give me that Goliath, I will kill it for you. Don't worry. What am I saying is this. You see, people, after David killed Goliath, they drew inspiration from David and they faced the Philistine that has been there, standing there for 40 days and nobody could dare touch them. When you want to be a leader, you cannot be the one that quits. Whether it is snowing, whether it is raining, people that have been around me will tell you, Saturday morning I'm going for evangelism. There's nothing that's stopping me. Either you're coming or you're staying, I'm on my way. Anyway, you can make excuses. I'm not going to make excuses to God. I'm going. And people have seen and said to me, oh, I, I, I really admire your, your tenacious nature. Well, because I'm the leader. And I've seen the reward that's ahead of me. And therefore, I cannot quit. Because the glory of the latter days is far, far greater than what I can see now. And I must not despise the days of small beginning. Number four, or number five now, is please lay aside any weight that easily besets you. Why do people quit? They're carrying too much weight. One of the things that's very, and I mean no disrespect to our sisters and brothers and fathers and mothers, that characterizes um, Africans, let me, let me use that in quote, especially Nigerians, is that they like carrying excess luggages. I mean, the ticket clearly says 23 kilo. I mean, you're going to the airport. There's no need for fasting and praying. I don't believe in that fasting and praying. Asking God to show you favor in front of the person that's checking you in. The, key, the ticket says 23 kilo. It does. It says 23 kilo. He just said it from the beginning. Now, you go to the airport, you carry 32. Clearly, it has told you it's 20, uh, 23. And then you need now begin to fast and pray. That Lord, let the scale change. Let the scale change. Let the scale change. No. Don't waste your time doing that. You, you have a lot of more better things to do with your time in prayers than pray that this, the scale will change. The truth is, of the matter is this. Invest your time in the right place. Get rid of excess luggages. Many of us are carrying excess luggages of so many things in our lives. And that is weighing us down and making us quit. You must learn to prioritize. Even your friends. People are carrying excess luggages of friends. 20 friends cannot play for 20 years, as they always tell us when we were younger. 20 friends cannot play for 20 years. There are some friends that I had when I was in secondary school that I don't know where they are now. There are some I have when I was in university that I don't know where they are now. And as life goes along, you will meet new people that they will form friendship with. Some of them will become acquaintance and some of them will be, you know, close friends. And that's how life is. So some people try to pull along and drag along so many things as weigh them down, which is making them quit. Because don't forget, my friend is saying pull back in a different direction. Now, what must I do so that I don't quit? Number one, please be honest with yourself. Now, most people expect me to give them a scripture verse and I, I will do that. But let me give you some practical tips. Be honest with yourself. One of the biggest challenges of life I've seen in the life of many people is that they're not honest with themselves. They're trying to live beyond their means. They're trying to go beyond where they can reach. And they get themselves in a lot of trouble. That is, that's just the way it is. And, and that has been the problem for many of us. We're trying to keep up with the Joneses, and, but the Joneses are going broke. So please be honest with yourselves. Be honest with yourself. Where are you in the spectrum of things? If you have not yet attained, then don't go for it. 
For example, a caterpillar cannot compare himself to a butterfly. They are not in the same stage of uh, metamorphosis. They have not both changed to the same thing. I can't compare myself with people who are pastoring 50,000 people. <laughs> I've not started that yet. It doesn't mean I won't get there or surpass it. It just means I'm not there yet. So be honest with yourself because if you're struggling in certain areas of your life, you must also be honest with yourself. What are the challenges that you're facing? Be willing to face the demons that you're that actually confronting you. You can't ignore that they are there. Because believe me, if you give the devil an inch, he will take his a mile. And it's difficult to cast out a mile when the devil cast the devil out when he's taking a mile than when he's taking an inch. I'm sure you know that. Now, number two is that you must constantly see, see your destiny with the eyes of faith, not with the eyes of the challenges around you. You don't want to quit? Look at your destiny with a higher faith, not the eyes of things and challenges around you. If I look at everything that's happened around me, I would also quit. That, that's the honest truth, and I'm being honest here. But I look at it from the eyes of faith. You see, one of the reasons why God shows us the picture of the end is because he wants to encourage us through challenges that we are going through right now. Many of us are going through challenges right now that might look overwhelming. But when you can hold on to God's unchanging hand, the reason why he sent prophets to you, send men of God to you, to show you or tell you, thus saith the Lord, the Lord has great plan for you, is for you to be able to remember, thus saith the Lord, he has great plan for you, even when things around you does not look great. I often tell my wife, I say, but this is not my hand. I can assure you this is not my end. Oh no, believe me on that one. That's not my this is not my end. Why? Because the picture of the future I've seen is far greater than this. So in the situation I'm in, I leave my sight by time, but I'm not I'm seeing my future with the eyes of faith. If you don't want to quit, keep looking at your future from the eyes of faith. Not an eyes of somebody said. Number three is that you must formulate a plan for growth. It's good for you, for God to tell you great things, but it's another thing. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 12, it said, work out your faith, uh, so work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, that's not going on the cross and dying for yourself again. Salvation in itself means deliverance. That's the key word, deliverance. It's a root word. It comes from deliverance, salvation. Now, if you're saying... I need to have a new plan for growth. In other words, if you're going to become the next chef, the next, God, for example, God told you you're going to have a, a more a, a chain of restaurants. I'm just making that as an example. Oh, I'm going to have a, a chain of restaurants in the future. And all you do is stare at the screen, looking at people cooking food, but not practicing, that you're not really formulating plan for growth. You have not taken your time to learn about uh, how a chain of re restaurants are run, how businesses are run, what kind of way you can use, can you source good um, products from, and um, what takes you, what makes you a successful one. I mean, it's good to watch shows. I watch uh, the likes of what's his name, Gordon Ramsay, when he goes and takes over people's restaurants and turns it around, and I watch shows like that because it shows diligence and um, and focus. But you must formulate a plan to get to your destination. And this is so, so important. Number four, please always seek the help of the Holy Spirit. Yes, it's good to be determined. It's, it's good to be decisive that you're going somewhere. You're going to do something. Your presence was the mark of the high calling. But you see, the Bible says, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. Proverbs 3 verse 5. He said, and then he will direct your path. Many of us has, have fallen into traps that's held us in the same spot for many years. Some people have fallen into traps that held them in the same spot for seven years. And that's seven years of your life that you're busy fight, firefighting instead of you making progress. Because one moment of still silly decision without consulting the Holy Spirit has led you into trouble. Don't worry, I've done that too. <laughs> so that's why I'm telling you. I've made mistakes that I wish I had just listened to what the Spirit of God said at that time. It would have saved me a lot of heartache, a lot of headaches, and I would have just got on my life a lot better. Because, you see, be very afraid of wolves in sheep clothing, as the Bible says. There are a lot of wolves out there who are in sheep clothing looking to pounce and devour you. Number four is that forget 
or let go of your past failure in order for you to succeed and move forward. In order for you to move forward and succeed, rather. Forget your past failures. Many people are still held back. That's hence the reason I said earlier that you must get rid of the weight that easily besets you. So you must drop those past failures. Every one of us have failed at something. In the, world of, in the words of Einstein, Einstein said something. He said, if you have not failed at anything, perhaps you have not tried something new. So when you're trying something new, you will fail at something. You will make mistakes. You will mess up. There's nothing wrong in that. But I'm hoping that you have learned from it. Now, so forget your past mistakes and then move on from it. Number five, please don't listen to your critics. They are the voice of the devil. Don't listen to your critics. I mean, there are people that will give you wrong advice for whatever reason, for their own selfish reason, because they're angry with you, because they can't see anything good coming out of you, they'll just give you wrong advice. That's why I said, make the Holy Spirit your, your guide at all times. Critics will criticize you even if you're doing well. They'll criticize you if you're doing badly. They'll criticize you if you're doing well. It doesn't make any difference. That's what they do. That's their job, is to criticize you every single step of the way. So you as a person must not give a listening ear to critics. You must be deaf to challenges around you. You must be blind to them because they will stop you from ever going forward. If I tell you all the things I go through in a week or I'm going through challenges I'm, I'm facing, it will be amazed that how come you're still preaching? But it doesn't make any difference to me because the critics do not determine my future. God does. And he does call it me or has called me is too faithful to fail. Whatever he has said he would do, he would do it. There's, there are things that are impossible with men, but they are forever possible with God. So I want to say again, it is too early to quit. Don't quit. Your reward is around the corner. You don't want to be like Saul in the books of 1 Samuel chapter 13, who went to offer the sacrifice just before, just in the nick of time that Samuel came. And he said, you have done foolishly. May we not be foolish and presumptuous in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now, let me close the sermon. Micah chapter 7, verse 8, where we began from. The Bible says clearly, it said, rejoice not over me, my enemies. For when I fall, I shall rise again. If you join that with my Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, the Bible says clearly, it's a righteous man falls seven times. Seven times he gets up. So it doesn't matter how many times you're falling this year. It doesn't matter what challenges have come your way this year. I can assure you that your future is greater than where you are right now. So keep looking forward and keep your eyes focused upon the author and the finisher of your faith. That's Jesus Christ. And it will be well with you in Jesus' name. Now shall we pray. Father, we thank you very, very much for this day. We give you glory and praise. We honor your holy name. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your patience to us. Thank you for the great reward that's imminent in our lives. Lord, we bless you. Our heart depends upon you. Our heart believes in you. And we know that our reward will not elude us. Father, I just want to thank you for everyone who has listened to the word tonight. I pray that, Father, you shall give them the grace to stand the test of time. That nobody will fall short. Nobody will fall on the wayside. That, Father, your words tonight that we've heard shall germinate and break for good fruits in our lives. To the glory and praise of your holy name. We thank you, our Savior, because we know you hear us always. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you all. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And I look forward to seeing you on Friday for the prayer meeting. Have a good evening. Good night. Bye-bye.